Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here today uh, to talk about robot simulation. Um, I don't know what's everybody's background here. I assume there are some people who are familiar with robotics and simulation, and there are probably some people who have never used a simulator before. Um, so before I jump into the, this talk and talk about all of the ways that you can customize simulation, uh, I wanted every one of you to think about what you expect from a robot simulation, like in your head, and it doesn't matter if you've uh, used simulation before or if you uh, are just here like listening about it for the first time, like think about what do you think is, is involved in a robot simulation? What features does it need? So while uh, you're thinking about that, let me introduce myself and the company I work for. So my name is Luis Pobel. Uh, I'm the tech lead of Ignition at Open Robotics. Um, at Open Robotics, we uh, developed open source software for robotics, and that includes uh, Simulator, but it also includes ROS, the robot operating system, which some of you uh, may have heard of, which is uh, highly used in academia and uh, in industry to, to develop robots. And the simulator side, uh, we developed Gazebo. And recently, I've been leading the, the Ignition team, which is uh, doing a refactoring of Gazebo. So you can see here that we have people all around the world. We have a lot of people in California, in the US. Uh, there are people all over the US as well. Um, and then there, we have some guys in Spain. And we have an office in Singapore with a lot of people. There are people in Tokyo. Um, and of course, we have like this global open source community online uh, that is always contributing with our project and, and helping us out and, and making the product even uh, better every time. So um, have you had time to think about what robot simulation is and what you expect from it? Um, I'm going to show now a definition of simulation that I hope fits all of the definitions that everybody came up with in their heads, which I hope is generic enough to include all of this. And then we can talk about the different, um, the different uh, aspects that, uh, that people may have thought about. So um, like simply speaking, simulation is uh, a robot simulator is creating a simulated reality for a virtual robot. So the, it's kind of like the matrix. The robot thinks that it's in the real world, but it's not really the real world. It's not really physical. Even the robot's body itself, the robot thinks it's real, but it's not. The whole point is to trick the robot, to make the robot think that it is real. And what's the point of that, right? Like, why, why are we tricking robots uh, and robot algorithms and the robot software? And like, there are many use cases for simulation. For example, um, like working on your algorithms, like working on the logic for your robots. If you have a simulated robot, uh, it can be very convenient because you don't need to go to a lab, you can do it from home, right? Like in these times when everybody's working from home, it's very convenient to just have your robot inside a computer for you. Um, there is also like maybe uh, there is only one robot available to your entire team. It's maybe a very expensive robot. Uh, so the company can't get one robot for each developer, but everybody has to make progress in parallel. So that's another use for, uh, for simulators. There is also um, maybe for education, you're teaching algorithms to students. They are gonna make mistakes. You don't want to break a physical robot, or maybe you don't have robots for all, everybody in class, or you're teaching online, right? There are, there are many uses, for example, machine learning. Uh, you uh, Usually for machine learning, you have to try do trial and error like thousands of times, maybe millions of times uh, of, of an algorithm until it gets things right. And you don't want to be doing this with a physical robot. So um, with all of these use cases, uh, you have a simulated robot to help you. Let's take a look at this little robot that I put here. So um, it's a simple robot. I, I'm con I can control it with the keyboard here. So I'm just like turning it and it can move, right? And this robot has a few sensors to feel the world, to see things around it. Uh, I put this pendulum here in the back just to have some something else that's going on. There's some physics running here. So this is one example of uh, robot simulation that you may have, right? Um, 
as you may have noticed by now, I'm running the entire presentation inside a simulator. So it's a little bit skewed to, uh, to this type of simulation right now. But I really want you to, to think about all of the possibilities that, that simulation gives you. This is one of them. Um, so let's go back there to the slide. So um, the simulator that I'm going to be uh, showing you today is called Gazebo. Uh, we develop it at Open Robotics. It's actually a, a very old project at this point. Gazebo started in 2002, so it's turning 18 years old. And uh, it's had many iterations over the time, but it's always been a, a multi-use robot simulator for several use cases. It, it never tried to be specialized to a specific use case, like many uh, simulators out there that are very overly specialized, which is also a very valid approach. The approach that we've always taken with Gazebo was to try to be a Swiss Army knife of robotics where you can really uh, address many different use cases. Uh, so that, that's what we've always done with Gazebo. And if there are people here who know Gazebo, who have used Gazebo, you probably used what we are referring to right now as Gazebo Classic, which is the Gazebo that uh, has been developed since 2012-ish. Um, and it has like a, a, a great interface and it has like a 3D scene and, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's, it looks different from what I'm showing you right now. Like my, some people who know Gazebo may be looking at this and thinking, this is not Gazebo. I know Gazebo, Gazebo doesn't look that colorful. Well, so what we're doing right now at Open Robotics is refactoring Gazebo into a new simulator that is still Gazebo, but now we're calling it Ignition Gazebo. And uh, in this refactoring, one of the main goals uh, has been to make simulation as flexible and as customizable as possible. So over the years, we've heard a lot of people using Gazebo and always wanting to tweak parts of it. People wanting to use a slightly different physics engines, people wanting to change the rendering, people wanting to add very specific be behaviors. Gazebo Classic offers a lot of ways that you can customize your simulation, you can run some plugins, but it's still, a monolith. It's still this one large application and uh, you, you often have to pay for what you don't use when you open the UI, for example. Everything is available to you immediately. There is an editor for you to create robots inside it. There is um, a plotting tool. There is 3D view. You can insert models. Everything is there for you available, which is very convenient but often users don't need all of these uh, tools, all of this functionality at once, which costs resources in your computer, right? As you're running it. And, some, and often you want simulation to be as fast as possible and you really want to only pay for what you use. So one of the uh, goals moving to Ignition has been to really make the simulation as customizable as possible, as flexible as possible, and as modular as possible. So you can really only take the bits and pieces that are interesting to you and use them on your specific simulation. So this refactoring looks a little bit more like this. Um, Gazebo is not a monolith anymore. It's a collection of libraries, ignition libraries that we are calling them. One of them is Ignition Gazebo, which kind of uses all of the other bits and pieces, puts them together and creates a simulator, which is the simulator that we're looking at right here. But all of these bits and pieces can also be used on their own separate um, and for other applications. There are people using uh, each one of these libraries. We have a math library. We have like a library that handles graphics. We had a, a library that handles a physics abstraction, a rendering abstraction. Um, like the, the, the graphical interface. So there are many libraries. I'm going to talk about some of them today. Um, and people are using it in other projects that are not necessarily simulators, right? So that's another point here. It's to make everything very modular and very flexible. And the simulator itself also very customizable. So um, let's talk about how simulation starts, right? Like. What, what are you loading when you load a simulation in, in Gazebo? Um, like for example, right here, I'm running a simulation that I've made specially for this, uh, for this presentation. And uh, 
this everything that you see here is described in the simulation description format sdf uh, and i mean really everything like from where things are placed to what uh, graphical interface elements are there which widgets are there to um, what functionality is in this world whether it's running physics or not uh, the rendering engine, everything is defined in this one file that is an SDF file, and it's an XML file. So let's take a look at the file together. Uh, I'll pull this, oops, I'll pull this a little bit here. So um, the file here is this .sdf file. I hope the font is big enough for everybody to see the, the letters. Um, so it's XML, and you have, like, for example, here, there's a GUI tag that is defining all of the widgets that are inside the simulation right now. So you can see that there is a 3D scene, there is the world control which has the play pause button in the bottom, um, and there are a few other widgets. And the important thing to notice is that if you don't put them here, you can load the simulator without them. So everything is, uh, you can opt in, you can opt out of them. Um, there is like a key publisher, there are, there are many widgets. So if you're really not gonna use something, you don't need to pay for it. You just download it. Um, so there is a bunch of things here for the UI. This is a specific thing for the presentation that is a custom plugin that I wrote that doesn't come with Gazebo. It's a separate project. You can just load any plugins from, from outside. Uh, you can see these four plugins here. They are not, they're outside of the GUI. Uh, this one is running physics. Physics itself is something that you can opt out of. You can say, I want to run a simulation without physics. You just remove this block and that's going to happen. This was not possible on Gazebo Classic. On Gazebo Classic, physics was always there. It was very opinionated about some things need to be part of the simulation. While in Ignition, we're saying, hey, if you just want to visualize your robot or maybe do some path planning or play back a log file, you probably don't need the physics. So we're going to make the physics optional. Or maybe you have some slightly different idea of what physics is and you have your custom physics plugin just loaded, you, you're not stuck with hours, right? And everything can be chosen at runtime. So there is like a plugin here to handle uh, user commands. So if you're, sorry about the noise. Um, so if you're not going to be receiving user commands, for example, uh, you're not gonna have a user uh, moving objects in the scene or spawning objects or anything like this, you don't need this user commands. So you can just throw it away and, and it goes on. And the same way that there are these four here. There's like lots of plugins that I didn't put here, right? For example, there is a Winds plugin that I didn't need for the simulation, so I just didn't include it. There is a buoyancy plugin, right? If you're doing an underwater world and you need things to be buoyant, or even like you want things to float in air, um, you can add a plugin for that. I didn't add it because that's not the simulation that I'm running. So everything is optional. And then below here, you can see that I have the entities themselves that are inside the simulation. So lights, models, um, you know, and everything from the visual description to the physical description of objects is here. You can see that I have some models that I'm just loading them from a website, from a server, and I'm going to show you guys uh, a little bit how this works. But, you know, you don't have to have all the resources uh, on your computer. You can just like, refer to these resources that are available online and, and, and load them, um, which, which are available for free, you know. Um, for example, you can see here that there are some physical descriptions. You can see the mass of the vehicle. You can see um, its collision property. So it has like a box. So it's going to collide with other things. You can see visual properties and materials and what it's going to look like. So everything. Is defined in this SDF file. So let's go back to our simulation here. So I hope you got a good idea of how the simulation was composed together, right? And how everything here that you're seeing can be just removed and other things can be easily added as well. Um, so yeah, I mentioned that website where uh, models are in, and that's uh, ignitionrobotics.org. 
we have an online database of SDF files that are ready to be put into simulation. And that's not limited to Gazebo. There are other simulators using SD format as, does, as their description format. And you can see here that you can find like humanoid robots. There are self-driving cars. There are quadcopters. It's, it's really a multi-use simulator for, for many different use cases. And, and you can find a lot of these models there. Let me uh, show you how it works. For example, um, let me pull my browser here and I have the, the website loaded. So you can see that there are several uh, models here that are ready to be uh, inserted into a simulation. You can choose one. And it's as simple as just like coming here in this drag me button and dragging it into the, bra the, the simulation. And voila, you have um, a little model here and it has physical properties. So it's by like, if I pull it up, it falls with gravity. Um, so they, they're ready for simulation for you. And then you could have a robot here that is manipulating squirrels, I guess, if that's what your application is. Uh, so I really recommend you, you check out that website to see if there are uh, the models that you need or also to upload your models to the website so other people can also use it in their simulations. Um, so the other part of the story, I showed you the XML, but you saw that it was loading a lot of plugins, right? And all of these plugins are written in C++. Uh, so everything from the graphical interface plugins to the physics plugins to the rendering plugins, everything here are written in C++. And that, that's something that I think it's, it's important to point out in case people were expecting for a more like scripting interface. Um, you, Ignition doesn't support it directly, but for example, you could use ROS, the robot operating system to control your robot using Python or JavaScript, or uh, you know, ROS has bindings for many languages, and then you control the robot inside the simulation uh, through through plugins that are already provided for you, for example. So you don't need to use C++. You can use other frameworks like mm -hmm. ROS, but if you want to use the simulator directly, then that's a, you're going to have to write some C++ plugins or load some C++ plugins. So let's talk about physics. Um, the, the simulation here. Why is it stopped? Oh, the, the pendulum got to a rest. That, yeah, chaotic behavior, huh? It, it got kind of tired. Um, so let's talk about physics, which I assume is one thing that almost all of you probably thought of when you thought of robot simulation. You, like if, when I asked you to imagine your simulation, you probably think, well, it needs physics running, right? And some people may be thinking, well, how can physics be customizable or flexible, right? Like physics is one thing. We, we know the real world we have, like we know that we throw something to the top and it falls with gravity and it's always the same answer. There are no multiple answers for physics, right? Well, the reality is that the world, the real world is very complicated. Like you have people making art outside, you know, the real world is complicated. So, uh, <laughs> So there, is, there are different levels of detail that you can simulate. You can simulate the behavior of atoms and you can uh, simulate the behavior of planets. And you know, there, there are many things in between there. Usually for, for simulation, what people think of is rigid body dynamics. So you have something kind of like this pendulum here, which is composed of like simple bodies that are, um, that are moving like, you know, that are moving uh, according to forces that are being applied to them, um, but they are not deformable, they are not breakable, uh, but there are other uh, simulation applications that may be more interested in soft bodies or other robot applications that may not even be interested in um, any dynamics at all. They are just interested in knowing where the robot is. Think of like you have a warehouse with 100 robots and you really don't care about the angles of the wheels of every single robot and what's the force that the floor is doing and for all of the robots in the world, right? You really just wanna know where the robots are and whether they bumped into a human or if they're bumping into each other or if they're very close to a wall, if they dropped the a product, you know, that, that's the level of detail that you want. So you can um, really, this is very distracting. So you can really, um, yeah, change, like 
tune the simulation for, for your use case. That's why on Ignition, we have a physics abstraction layer that we call the Ignition Physics. It's a, one of the libraries in the ecosystem. And you can pretty much load different physics engines into your uh, simulation and you can choose them at runtime. So the important thing to notice here is that you describe your world using SD format once. And once you load the, the simulation, you can choose the physics engine on the fly and you don't need to change uh, your world to adapt to each different physics engine. So it makes it very easy for you to just try different things. So by default, we have support for Dart. Um, and then we also developed this TPE engine in-house, which stands for Trivial Physics Engine, that uh, whose goal is to be very simple, very, uh, it, it doesn't do dynamics, it, it only does kinematics, you set a velocity and a model goes, and it doesn't collide with anything, it just keeps going until you tell it to stop. And that's very useful for cases where you have like hundreds of robots and you are not really interested in the dynamics. We have some partial support for Bullet as well. And the important thing is that it, since it's plugin based, anyone can write a plugin to their own physics engine and easily load it into the simulator. And they don't need to worry about if they're special to use physics, they don't need to worry about uh, rendering. They don't need to worry about uh, like the graphical interface. They don't need to, to care about all of the other bits and pieces. All of all that they need to care about is their specialty. They are specialized in the physics engine. They're interested in a very specific behavior. They can leverage the rest of the ecosystem and really focus on what they're good at. Let me show you um, an example of the simulation here. I told you that it's right now running with Dart. And uh, so if like, you know, you can see the dart has the dynamics here for the pendulum. It has friction of the wheels with the floor. That's why the wheels are moving, right? So let's close the simulation right now. And I'm going to reload it with TP, which is the trivial, trivial physics engine. Um, here. So it's the same command as I used originally, but now I'm passing it this physics engine that's it. The file that I'm loading is the same one that I showed you before. And then here we are. So let's go to the robot. And now you can see that I can still control the robot, but the wheels are not turning. You can see that the pendulum is stopped. And that's fine. That's what this specific uh, physics engine is, is made to do. It's just the high level behavior of the robot and it's much faster. Like right now, I'm throttling the simulation to run at real time. So the simulation time is the same as our real time. But you know, it could be running um, much faster than Dart would with, with uh, many robots, for example. You could run like 10, 15 times faster than real time if you really want simulation to go fast and to get some quick results. Right? So that's an example with TPE. So let me close the simulation and go back to loading with Dart because it's so sad not to have the pendulum moving. So I just removed the physics engine and we are back to our world with actual physics. So um, let's talk about sensors. So I showed you our physics abstraction layer. Um, my mouse is stuck in one of the rooms. So um, I showed you the physics abstraction, how it works, how it's useful to have different physics. Uh, but a simulator is not only about physics. I hope that when you guys thought about uh, what your simulator look, would look like and what you need from a simulator, many of you uh, probably also thought of sensors, right? The robot is not blind, just moving around without collecting any data. It's very important for the robots to sense that world right here inside the matrix. We're trying to fool you. We have to create a fake world for the robot to be in there. And uh, there are many types of sensors that people use in physical robots, and we have to simulate them all inside simulation. So everything from IMUs to GPS to bumper sensors, right? All, all of these things are necessary for like if you want to have the same the behavior of the physical robot inside the simulation, you have to 
fake that data. Uh, but perhaps the type of data that people focus on the most is rendering data. So data that can be generated with a rendering engine. So images or for example, LiDAR data, right? Like LiDAR are those like depth sensors that you can see how far things are around that self-driving cars usually have that big LiDAR on the top. Um, those things we simulate with a rendering engine. And uh, the, the rendering engine uh, can be, it, it's also in a spectrum, right? Like reality is very detailed, uh, has very good resolution, uh, has amazing effect, right? Reality. But if you're going to simulate all of that, that's going to be very resource intensive. And often you don't need that. If you're just, uh, if you just have a simple robot that just wants to see if something is closed in front of it, or if it, there is a red blob in front of it and the robot just follows red blobs, it doesn't need very high definition red blobs and very photorealistic, right? It just needs something that puts a red blob in front of it in the right place as it moves. So um, there is also a spectrum there to choose your rendering engines. That's why you guessed it, we also have a abstraction layer for rendering. Uh, by default, we support an Ogre one, which is an open source rendering engine. And one is the, the 1.x versions. So 1.9, 1.10, 1.12, 1 we support them. We have a plugin for them, but we also support Ogre two, which is actually the default, which is the, what I'm running here. And Ogre two compared to Ogre one has more modern features. It supports physically based rendering, which has a lot of nice special, uh, like more realistic effects. So it looks much more real, but uh, you know, as was the case with the physics, if you have a different rendering engine, if you really want to use a different engine that has different features, uh, maybe it's a rendering engine that is more specialized um, into human faces or another one that is more specialized into terrain and you need the terrain to be very realistic. You can just integrate those rendering engines and, and use them in your simulation as a plugin. And it's the same situation with the physics. You can uh, load your simulation, you just define the simulation once with the SDF file, and then you just at runtime say, run with this render engine. And the render engine is even cooler than the physics because you can have a different render engine for you as the user and another render engine for the robot. Let me show you what I mean. Um, so for example, here this guy uh, has two sensors, a LiDAR and a camera. Let's take a look at the LiDAR first. Um, so this is what the LiDAR looks like, right? I, I put just a very simple LiDAR in the robot. So these are rays that can sense uh, when there's something in front of the robot and uh, each one of the rays is independent and feels that, that depth. So if we get, for example, close to the pendulum, uh, we can see that whenever like the pendulum kind of hits those rays, the, the robot senses that there is something there, right? This is one of the sensors. This is all done with the rendering engine. The other one is the camera. The robot has a camera located in the same place as the, as the uh, LiDAR. Uh, so the robot can see the, the pendulum as well. And this is what I'm talking about. Here, it happens that uh, I'm using the same rendering engine for my view and for the robot's view. But you could use, for example, a very realistic engine for the robot if you want, because you really are interested in that photorealism. But for you as the person debugging the program, you don't really need that photorealism. You just want things to run fast and you just really want to see where things are. So you could use a quicker, uh, less uh, resource intensive render engine for your own view and leave the robot there with, with their uh, fancy view. And those two can coexist, it's fine. Let me show you um, an example of what Ogre 2 can do that Ogre 1 can't. So for, you can see this, the reflections here on this uh, fire extinguisher, the detail here, I hope it's going through uh, properly through the internet, you know? Um, but you can see that there is a lot of detail. There is a lot of like, when I move the camera, there is like this environment map that we call, which is the lighting, faking the lighting that is surrounding the object as if there were some objects around it. And when you move it, you can really see that. 
You can do this with Ogre 1, for example. With Ogre 1, the maximum that you could get is something that looks like this, right? It's not so shiny. Um, it doesn't have the environment map. And you know, it doesn't have that, that metallic feel here on, the, on, on this dial and so on. So um, you know, I recommend that you try like to load the simulation with Ogre and Ogre 2 and see the Ogre 1 and Ogre 2 and see the differences in how these uh, things are being rendered. Um, so let's go to our rendering engines. So same idea as a physics, it's plugin based. Let's talk about the graphical interface now. Um, everything that you're seeing here, as I showed you in the SDF file, uh, is optional. You know, the, these uh, items here, so you can pick things and move them around. Uh, you can insert objects into the simulation. Um, all of these widgets here are optional. You choose to have them there if it makes sense. You can build your custom dashboard specific to your simulation. Uh, and then you can put other plugins in it. There is a list here of plugins that come uh, with Ignition Gazebo for you when, you when you install it. So let me try, for example, here the Entity Tree. This shows you all of the uh, entities that are inside the simulation. You can see in the double pendulum, for example, that it has an upper link and it has some visuals inside. So you can really inspect and you can say like move to and you go to the pendulum. Um, and you can see it there. There is, for example, a component inspector. So when you select the double pendulum, you can really see um, you know, information about each part of it. So if you see, for example, the lower link, you can see its pose and how it's changing uh, in real time. Uh, for example, another one that is cool to see is the plotting. So um, if I go down here, the plotting showed up here. So I can drag any of these values my mouse is getting stuck, to the plot. And you can see here, this is the roll, uh, which is one of the, the three rotations of the lower link of the, of the pendulum. And it's, you're just plotting it in real time. You can export it to uh, a file if you want, um, a CSV file. So you can use it on your paper. You can yeah, use this as, as you need. And then you can also like collapse these ones and you can have more uh, widgets here as you need for your own specific use case. So um, what else can I say about the GUI? It's very customizable. You can save your client configuration. So when you open the next time, all of the widgets are going to be located in the same place. Uh, you can choose, for example, light or dark theme. If you're interested in that, um, you can ch change even like the colors of the UI. Um, if you don't like the default colors and then just set, have your local configuration, always load things the way that is, is best for you for your workflow and you know matches your preferences. Uh, all of this is using Qt Quick with QML. Um, Gazebo Classic used Qt widgets, which had a more, um, more scientific software look and feel. The QML, uh, we're using it with material design, which really allows us to have these uh, more modern look, almost like look, looks like a web uh, interface with a lot of shadows and, and a lot of like animations to, to move things around. And this is all like, you know, you can write your own plugins for your own use cases. And there are people using uh, Ignition GUI for other things uh, besides Ignition Gazebo, for example, there is um, a project that is using Ignition GUI and Ignition Rendering to render data coming from a real physical robot in 3D. So you can inspect that data and you can see data from many robots at the same time in the same place. Uh, so they are not using Ignition Gazebo, they are not using the simulator. They don't need to load the physics engine. They don't even need to load the Ignition physics. Um, They're just using the graphical interface and the rendering. And that's really what we wanted by breaking Gazebo apart like this, is for people to leverage the each one of the parts independently in their own projects. There is a, another project using Ignition GUI and Ignition Rendering for uh, path planning of robots. Uh, there is a different simulator that is igni using Ignition GUI and Ignition Rendering with their own uh, physics 
uh, layer that is not based on ignition physics, and that's fine. So that that's very uh, that's the real point. Like we want people to use these things in different places. Um, our like latest uh, developments, all of our releases. Uh, here is the site for this presentation, the, the repository where I have this presentation specifically that you can just clone and, and run uh, in your computer. I'm always on Twitter um, posting about simulation if people are interested. And here, hashtag sim slides, uh, it's the, the, the project that I have to run slides inside simulation. And it works with both Gazebo Classic and Ignition. Um, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, I do see one question here from Dave. Can the separate function of a robot end effector be modeled with the robot? Can which function? Can the separate function of a robot end effector be modeled with the robot? I, I don't think I understood the question. Sorry, it's what what function of the robot of the end? No effector? worries, uh, Dave. If you want to to clarify your question, oh, he said like a paint gun. Um. So, do you mean like if you can create a robot that has in its end effector attached um, some some specific like tool. Uh, and yeah, that, that's entirely possible. You just define that in the SDF file and you set the correct physics properties uh, for it and visual properties and you're good to go. Okay, Dave said yes. So, so thank you, Elise. I think you answered his question. <laughs> Anybody has any other questions for Louise, please do place them um, either in the Q&A box, the chat box, or you can raise your hand, whichever you prefer. But but that was a great presentation, Louise. Thank you so much again. No, oh, thank you for the opportunity. Sorry about the, all the noise here. I really thought they were done before I started the presentation. That's okay. Life happens. We're yeah. in virtual world. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here. If we want to make AI to run the robot, that would probably have to be a plugin, correct? Yes, correct. So you can have a plugin, for example, that um, is reading the sensor data here and is is uh, processing that data and making some decision and sending comments to the robot. Uh, people usually use ROS for this kind of stuff, just because ROS comes with a lot of uh, tools out of the box for you to to add all kinds of behaviors to your robot. Uh, ROS is the robot operating system. And we have an interface to ROS uh, that you can easily use uh, Ignition with ROS. And then if you're using ROS, you don't need to write an Ignition plugin. You could just write a ROS script that can be a Python script. It can be, um, you know, it can be C++ as well. But ROS is, is a little bit more flexible with the languages. Thank you, Louise. Uh, question here from James. Just to be clear, these are these tools available for free? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I so I, I did say pay, uh, but yeah, it's it's a like don't pay for what you don't use, but pay with resources of uh, like computing resources. So you know uh, the the simulator, all of the code is open source. It's all Apache two licensed. You can just take it and do whatever you want with it. You can ship a product with it, and you don't need to tell us anything. Perfect. Thank you. Another question here. This one's from Rebecca. Does Gazebo work with LabVIEW or Java-based robots? So yeah, for, for integrating with this kind of, uh, with these other softwares, I really recommend going through ROS uh, because I've seen people using ROS with LabVIEW. I've, I've seen people using, uh, you know, there's ROS Java, uh, both ROS 1 and ROS 2. Um, so I like, I recommend it, you leverage ROS for, for this kind of like robot software because then you can run the same software for your physical robot and for your simulated robot. If you wrote something that is an ignition plugin, that would work well for the simulation, but
but that wouldn't translate well to your real robot that doesn't know anything about ignition, right? 